Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's really an honor to be here on this platform, and uh, I do have to say that I feel like we're bringing a lot of color to this event. Literally, quite literally. Uh, and there are four of us here, and we're really glad to have our esteemed fifth member on the screens. Although you couldn't be with us in person, I hope we have an opportunity to interact in person in the future. Before I get into the actual content of the panel, I want to just acknowledge what a powerful thing it is that apart from being women leaders, we're very diverse in the industries that we represent. So when I was doing some research for this panel and I was looking up Sanjukta, the first thing that comes up is seven reasons IPS officer Sanjukta Parashar is truly formidable. <laughs> now, I'm sure that Many of us have been described many things, but being called formidable is, is quite a compliment in itself. We've got Lovelyn here, who is a director and casting director. Many of our most loved films have had your hand in it. One among them is Slunged Up Millionaire. I've seen that you've done the casting for Namesake and so many other things. She was telling us a little bit about her secret projects backstage. I'm not going to spill any of those secrets here. We have Vinita Ji, who is the chairperson of Nico Cables and uh, I think a veteran of industry, although she doesn't look it. And we've got Chinjini, who's joined us virtually, who is with the co-founder of SALT. And um, I think to just kick this off, I would like to ask one question in general to all of us, and that is, representing these different industries, how do you feel that women in the workforce or women in your industry are represented? And what do you think we can do to make it better? Hi, Bindu. Uh, first of all, uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, be here and speak on this panel today with these lovely ladies. Uh, well, uh, the topic of this panel has actually compelled me to reflect on my own personal and professional journey and think about what has worked for me. So the top three things that come to my mind are, first, being true to myself and having the courage of conviction to follow my dreams. So, uh, you know, uh, when I was getting married at the age of 18, I, and I wanted to complete my college, I was asked by my headmistress why I wanted to study further when ideally I should be focusing on my family. I took it up as a challenge by not only completing my college, but by getting an MBA degree while raising two young children and working. So what this experience did for me was that it gave me courage to try and help other women fight the conscious and unconscious biases, gender biases that exist in our society. So as a result, uh, what has happened has that whenever I've had a woman candidate who's been equally competent and qualified as the others I was evaluating, I have always tried to opt for the woman candidate, not only to ensure gender diversity, but for the reason that we women thrive in the VUCA world that we live in today, which is the world of volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity as we are constantly reinventing ourselves by learning, unlearning, relearning, you know, to fit into our various roles. We seamlessly move on from being a daughter, wife, daughter-in-law, co-worker, mother, while balancing all our roles seemingly effortlessly like a trapeze artist. Later, interestingly, I would like to mention as the director of IIM Cozy Code is sitting here, that um, you know, when I joined the board of IIM Cozy Code in 2017, I was the only woman director. But today, thanks to the director and the board's collective effort, we have 40% women directors and 50% female students at the institute. So now coming to the second thing that has worked for me has been having strong mentors at every stage and every role in my life. You know, you realize the importance of mentorship when you come from a very sheltered community in India, like I did. 
and are thrown into uncharted waters. When I went to Harvard Business School for my advanced management program at the age of 40, leaving two teenage children behind, I was completely intimidated being in a male-dominated classroom with business owners and CXOs from 40 different countries. But I overcame all my inhibitions due to the strong women's mentoring program whereby we women from all over the world had open and frank discussions about our problems, our struggles. So this made me ask myself that what is the single most thing about mentoring? You know, the answer is so simple. It's just about providing safe listening spaces. We as mentors need to practice deep listening before offering solutions or suggestions. The act of talking to an empathetic listener about your problems can be so empowering. So later, when I, uh, now that I'm on the global advisory board of Harvard Business School, I try and uh, mentor women aspirants as often as I can. So, um, you know, uh, the third thing, now coming to the third thing that has helped me has been creating strong and authentic support systems, both at work and at home. And uh, we are already seeing a reversal of the stereotype that women do not support other women. So I have managed to do so at work by being very encouraging to my women employees and empowering them. And at work, you just have to be respectful and share responsibilities. And believe me, it works like magic. You know, contrary to what we see in the Saas Bahu serials, my mother-in-law has been my greatest support system. Now, uh, to end it all, I would like to, you know, uh, talk about a very interesting thing uh, which I found during, uh, when I started my Vedantic studies during lockdown, I discovered that according to Vedas, there is absolute, that all human beings are pure consciousness on a spiritual level, regardless of their gender. If we connect this with the future of the metaverse, we find that as digital avatars, gender ceases to matter. So now we all need to use our human intelligence in order to win over artificial intelligence. In this age of technological and digital disruption, which is affecting both the genders equally. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'd like to pop over to Shinjini, who's on the screen, and ask you your perspectives about what you think constitutes a fair workforce for women and, and what you think we could do. So we just heard Vinita Ji saying that she's never had a situation where being the only woman in the room was a problem or she's always felt supportive. Have your experiences been similar? We'd love to know. So first of all, thank you and apologies for not joining in person. It seems like I'm missing out on a lot of that energy in that room uh, and, and next time. Uh, but I had some, uh, you know, personal emergency. So um, thank you and uh, pleasure being here. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've had a very uh, interesting life journey, which I, which I think I've lived my life in the reverse because I started out being a bureaucrat. I was at the Reserve Bank of India. And then I moved into the private sector. I was a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was a CEO for Paytm's bank. And I was at Citibank where I was heading consumer bank before I just left to start up my, uh, my startup, uh, which is SALT, which is building a platform for women to buy more financial products and make more financial decisions. So the reason I'm describing my career journey is because it's uh, at every stage, I've had a very different experience uh, in terms of what, uh, what promotes and what inhibits women from staying on. Because I, for me, the biggest message that women need to take from any of this conversation is to just stay on because it is hard and it is not, there is no way that you can underestimate that challenge. So when I started out in the RBI uh, as a 22 year old, it really wasn't hard to stay on because actually, frankly, and I, and I would love to hear Sanjukta's views on that, but actually the government does make you feel a lot more empowered. And the, I, at least I faced very few problems and they were also role models. So while we were there, Mrs. Udeshi became the, the first woman to be deputy governor of RBI. 
And some journalist asked her in the interview, what does it feel like to be a, the first woman to be RBI's deputy governor? And she said, what does it have to do with my woman? And at the time, we all thought, oh, wow. But as I have grown older and interacted with a lot more women and learned better and gone to the U.S. to study, taken a study break, had my children, done different jobs in different uh, positions in different types of organizations, I have learned this very, very clearly. It is incredibly hard. So first of all, uh, women that stay on, congratulations to them. And really, we are thankful to them for becoming the role models that they do become for a lot of younger women, because younger women need to see that this is possible. So what Vinita just talked about is extremely inspiring, because it is so easy to be to to you know have the privilege of being able to stay at home and uh, you know uh, and 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 it's not to underestimate the life of women that stay at home they actually do a lot of work so one of our core philosophies at salt is that we start recognizing the fact that women at home do equally important work so we'll call ourselves salt because we uh, you know it's essential it's necessary to your life but it's cheap so it's like women's uh, work and and their contribution you just have to start understanding that it is extremely extremely uh, important even if it is invisible to you so i think in many ways we need to uh, start looking at this uh, in a slightly more comprehensive way and everything that vinita says being supportive having networks having mentors all of those things are extremely important and a lot of times these will be men for the simple reason that there are more more men there and a lot of the my biggest learning that i took with me in all these years because i've worked 32 years now um is that uh, a lot of the subconscious bias in men is uh, there to for you to break because uh, nobody has uh, challenged it and nobody has questioned it before sometimes it happens at home because somebody may have a very smart daughter who may say dad you're talking rubbish it i've heard it being said uh, many times or sometimes at work somebody will say something which is inappropriate and you will just not uh, contest because it's you will think it's not for you to do it but I've always believed that one should do it because a lot of the people are not doing it because they want to actually make you feel like an idiot or, you know, not, not feeling included or not being valued, but they just don't know how to do it. So it helps to work with your male colleagues to kind of bring them into the circle, not just on the International Women's Day to, for them to join the snack, but actually on a day to day basis at any point of time when you see something which is not appropriate, which feels like it might destroy your workplace, uh, you know, inclusiveness, then you have to speak up. And in the startup world, I also feel so one of my disappointments actually is that even though we seem to evolve a lot on, you know, gender, or our attitude towards equality, or our attitude towards even equity, um, somehow, that shift in technology, which, uh, you know, Vinita talked about uh, the, the, you know, from Vedanta philosophy to, uh, to the, the, you know, um, uh, web three and stuff like that. But for some reason, we are also coding a lot of our biases into the technology. So the reason we decided to build SALT as uh, the three of us was because we realized that some active intervention was required. Otherwise, all the biases that we have on our, in our physical world uh, about women, they're getting coded into games. They're getting coded into images that our children see. They're getting coded into cinema. They're getting, getting coded into you know, technology in various ways. And so therefore, we felt like an, uh, that intervention would be useful so yeah and we we want to be very very conscious about it and to if you ask me what is it that uh, we are doing about it is just to shine the light i mean you know you you shine the light on something it becomes a problem to deal with well i love that story behind the name salt i think that's that's such a powerful thing and that's something that we should all take away from this if nothing else that you know just because it's inexpensive and sometimes invisible doesn't mean that it's not really critical to holding anything, everything together. And I think that's a beautiful analogy for the role of women at home and at work as well. Uh, Sanjuktaji, I'd love to know, you know, I'm sure you get this challenge all the time. What's it like being a woman IPS officer? Why did you decide to do this instead of doing something more feminine? Or, you know, what, what are the stereotypes that you face on a day-to-day -day basis, and how do you feel that your role helps change that? And do you ever feel like you're the only woman in the room and that works against you? Are there women who've gone ahead of you who've opened the doors for you? Well, ever since uh, Mrs. Kiran Bedi joined the force, uh, I think it has broken quite a few stereotypes for women in the Indian police service. 
But having said that, uh, this is a job which doesn't have too many women. I mean, there, there are a lot of women in the government service per se, but in the police, we are very underrepresented. We are probably about two to three percent and not more. There are challenges to recruitment, yes, uh, in the sense that a lot of women who want to join at different le levels, even if it is the constabulary or at a sub-inspector level, they don't have the education for it. And also, like the mindset, you know, everyone looks at us and thinks that, oh, you've studied that much and you've become a police, you know, person. Like, that's how they look at you. They don't really think, I mean, you're all here, everyone is going to nod. Your perception of a cop is the guy on the traffic beat, right? Like around Delhi, wherever. That's, your, that's the man you have seen. Or your idea of a cop is the guy in the uniform in the market with his motorcycle moving around. And believe me, that's not a great way of, you know, show, of showcasing ourselves as police officers. Uh, but when you look at women and why we don't have so many women in the force, one is the, the, the image that a lot of people do not want women to go, like they don't want their daughters or their daughters-in-law to be police personnel. The second thing is that the person herself does not think that she is capable. Thirdly, everyone thinks it's a very tough job. Fourthly, which is like a huge stereotype that I face all the time, is that if you're a cop, you have to be corrupt. I mean, how is it that that's not happening to you? I mean, let me address the elephant in the room. Yeah, why aren't you corrupt? I mean, that's one of those things. And it comes from everywhere. Like, there are senior functionaries who have told me, to make your honesty ka medal milega. This was what I was told. And uh, relatives would be like, Acha, you don't have this, you don't have that. I mean, you don't have a beacon here. <laughs> you know, all of that. I mean, all these things that people think of are, are, you know, what the cops do. It's not like that. We're all normal people. We all have to run our families. We have our children. We have our friends. We have our hopes and dreams of, you know, maybe cooking something. But then you don't know. You have a meeting or you have something going on and you're not, never even going to get home in time to eat your own meal. <laughs> yeah, I won't forget the salt. So I think that's where, you know, the whole uh, stereotype comes in and it's very difficult to break, but I think one at a time, there are so many examples of police service officers, both men and women, which you will be able to see when, even when you Google, and that's going to like, I think, change the perception slowly. When it comes to the women in the workforce and how we can have more, I think one is that we should have these uh, training programs for girls in schools and colleges and other institutions who want to join the police. We have a large number of roles in Assam recently. The sprinter Hima Das has joined the police. The boxer Lovelina has joined the Assam police. I'm hoping more girls will join in. Uh, what I think is most important is that women also have to break the stereotype and understand that they need financial independence. The world has changed. Gone are the days when you can take money from someone. And when you understand that, I think the women will come out and join uh, various kinds of professions. I will agree what Srijani just said, that uh, when you're in the government though, if you're a woman, a lot of things are taken care of. Like, for example, uh, we won't be harassed or bothered much at work. But if you're the only woman in a room uh, full of men making decisions, you run the risk of being invisible because suddenly you will become one of the boys, you'll become one of the dudes. Or maybe your voice, which is dissenting, would be looked at as being aggressive and being emotional sometimes. So these are, I think, the issues that we face. Thank you for that really powerful perspective. Uh, should I say formidable, or is that just an adjective you're tired of at this point? One thing that, that really resonated with me about what you said is this idea of women not having the confidence to do something. And that's something that we've seen a lot uh, where, where I work at SAPA, where we have actually tried to, to move this around in the way that we understand the capacity of women and often it's women who are coming back into the workforce after a significant break um, and I need to highlight that many times it's not the woman's choice to take a break and I always say that if it's if you have to choose between leaving your young child at home and pursuing home alone if you don't have family support 
and a career, that is not a choice. So many women who are at home are not at home because they choose to be at home, but they're at home because of circumstances. There are women who choose to be at home and they're doing a great job of it. And, and like Shinjini said, full respect to them. But we should acknowledge that there are so many more women who would like to be out pursuing careers who don't have that luxury because of the way the ecosystem has been designed in India today. And when they come back, after a gap of five or 10 or sometimes even 15 years, they don't have the confidence to do what we know they can do, what everybody outside can see that they can do. So we've often sort of benchmarked them based on the ability that we see, but we give them a slightly less complex role for the first three months and then we fast track them. And uh, my current head of operations, I brought her on as event planner because she was like, I can't do anything, but I'm, I'm kind of good at, at planning parties. But she's an organizational mastermind. And after three months, we brought her from event planner to something, to some, and now she's heading operations. And she's able to manage literally thousands of unique accounts without a flaw. So I think this idea of women not feeling that they're capable enough is something that, that comes across in many industries. Now, I'd love to hear your perspective on how the creative industry functions in terms of how do you see the role of gender in it and how do you see that changing? Hello everyone. Um, I have to say that I, when I started out, which was Monsoon Wedding 2001, I um, was so mesmerized, I have been, even as a young kid, so mesmerized by cinema that I didn't quite focus on my own identity. I didn't enter uh, the world of cinema thinking I'm a woman. That's not the first thing. In fact, that's still not the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, certainly, there was no room for that in those days because I was too, as they say, blinded by the light, blinded by wanting to do something, uh, express myself um, in a way that was exciting, in a way that reaches out to the maximum number of people. Um, and that can be so inspiring because it had been that for me as a growing kid. Um, so, like Shinjini was saying, in fact, earlier today, and I, it resonates with me, that she said that it's only later she realized. I, over the course of time and over my, you know, the course of experience that I've had in the movie business, I now realize that I am now alive to being a woman. That I bring something special to the table because I'm a woman. It's not because of just my obsession with cinema, which Definitely, it's all about the work. I have a passion for it. I've always had a passion for it. And that's, that's the place I operated from. But I also operated from a place of feeling something rather than constructing something. I was always about how does this make me feel? How does cinema make me feel? How do I do something that, um, without actually analyzing it so much, but just going in with a feeling which is, I think, um, an asset that women have, tend to have. I, I hate stereotyping, so I don't want to put uh, men and women in separate boxes because I don't think um, that's very useful to any of us in any business, especially in the kind of work field that I'm in, which is all about fluidity of thought and flexibility. And so you have to be able to navigate both kinds of spaces, whether you're an assistant director or you're a casting director or you're a director, which is the kind of the journey that I've had, um, is that you have to have all kinds of skills. But I think that what we bring to the table first and foremost is that we have emotional capital. We come from a space of vulnerability. We come from a space of self-doubt. We come from being underconfident whether we acknowledge it or not, uh, I think that most of us, uh, and for generations, women have had to, you know, always look at themselves. If, if anything goes wrong, we, we tend to look at ourselves first and say, Meri galti hogi. This is definitely something I've done wrong. And to be able to um, sort of express that in the kind of space that I'm in, I think adds something special. Because... Um, you can be aggressive um, while carrying your vulnerability. And that's what I've always encouraged in people that I've worked with. Over, you know, sort of starting from being an assistant to now making my own stuff. I love that. Uh, 
I'm sort of seeing this, this shade card, if it were, of this from imposter syndrome to being vulnerable to sort of finding yourself at a place where you're confident, sort of confident, and then you become assertive. And then the, the gendered difficulty here is that the moment you start touching that confident and assertive, you become bossy, not assertive. And then there's another word that starts with B that takes it a little further than that. So Shinjini, I would love to know from you in, in your perspective, how does a woman in finance, for example, or how does a woman in a leadership role in the sort of industry that you're in navigate this space of imposter, vulnerable, assertive, and, and not being labeled with, with other things? I think, um those of us who make it, uh, and I think it's across industries, uh, but finance, I guess it's a little bit more because, um, you know, the jargon just gets to you faster. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so you, you know, you go into cinema and I know that it's very tough technically because my, my son just went into that industry and I now realize how hard it is. But for everybody, it's like, yeah, yeah, I've seen five movies, so I must know something about it, right? <laughs> but finance is somehow something which tends to break your confidence up front because uh, the money that you know, the money that you use every day, and again, uh, we want to bring that at my, my company is called My Salt uh, for that reason, that we want to bring that intuition back into money because we just think that everybody manages money all the time. I mean, you can be a hippie. Uh, but you will still need to know money because you'll need to pay for something. And that um, somehow the industry just tends to make you feel inadequate. Uh, that happens to both consumers as well as to employees. Now, as you keep getting more senior, what tends to happen is that uh, some of them are usual regular things that happen in every industry, which is your network, your mentoring support, your uh, the number of uh, uh, you know opportunities that you are given, the, the ability to be mobile, the ability to change jobs, all of those are across industries. Uh, I think in finance, we actually, in India in particular, we've actually had a very good situation for some time, thanks to a few organizations, including Reserve Bank of India, where I was for that matter, or, uh, you know, ICICI, which kind of groomed many, many leaders of, uh, you know, the generation, my generation, and a little bit before that. And we all felt very inspired. We all felt like, you know, we were ready to like sort of uh, you know, tip that balance. The interesting thing is that the, the, the ones that make it and they come to the top and many of them almost are like men, right? Sanjukta was saying, you, your survival teaches you to be, uh, to be in that room, uh, almost like a man. Uh, or, or you bring that uh, special voice and you face that challenge of uh, sometimes being uh, labeled emotional, sometimes being labeled, like I've been labeled too kind. And that I always find that hilarious. I mean, when people say, oh, you're too kind to be a CEO or whatever I have been. It's just hilarious for me because you are never too kind to live on this planet. I mean, this planet needs a lot more kindness that, than you can bring to it. So there's never that you can be too kind. But then, you know, that's, that's one thing that you'll hear or you'll hear you're too, like, you know, democracy doesn't work. Like, it, so you do get the, to hear that. But I think all of us, once we've gotten to that point, we know our comeback lines, we know how to deal with that. We sometimes laugh, sometimes smile, sometimes make fun, sometimes we survive. The challenge is that the, the line between the ones that make it and the, the gap between the ones that make it and the ones that are still there, that gap is very big. So when Vinita was talking about pulling women up uh, from a pool of people that are equally qualified, my challenge has always been in financial services that finding that pool of people where you have a number of candidates of which there is a woman or more than one woman who are equally qualified as a man is not easy. And I have consciously, and I'm very respectful to the organizations where I've worked, where we have been able to take these calls to say that we will take a call on somebody who may not be exactly on that line, but if they show potential, we will fast forward them because we need more leaders to bring more leaders and to continue that line up. And the, when you do that, it's very hard because you have to answer a lot of questions to everybody, including yourself. But when you don't do that, the effects of that are very obvious. The effects of that, you look at, uh, I mean, my uh, employer, RBI today, and I've been very proud of RBI all along, but today there are no women in that senior leadership, right? You look at ICICI, you look at the financial system today. So, and that happens because while you had some, you did not have that pipeline. And I think in financial services, the pipeline has been something that 
I've always worried about and it is kind of showing up. So yeah, I, I'm sure it's in other industries, but I just want to talk about mine. I think touching upon this idea of the pipeline is something that's very relevant. You were talking about maybe have more uh, interactions with people at school to show them that these are things that are possible. How would you find that you know this pipeline can be built in your industry? So she was talking about this pipeline of leadership and how we have to create a pipeline of women leaders because there's such a huge gap between where we are or where the leadership is and, and where the next line is. So how do we support and build this pipeline uh, in the coming days? No, definitely we do need to, you know, build a pipeline and have a, a you know, good succession planning for women because women often drop out of workforce before they leave senior, uh, reach senior positions. Mm. So, for various reasons. So, we have to actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, address this right at the grassroots level, right uh, by mentoring them, supporting them, providing them the right kind of working environment. You know, like I was talking about grassroots. Now, let me tell you something interestingly. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, at my tea estate, we had an on-premise crash where the children of the women workers were taken care of by trained helpers while their mothers worked. So this kind of, you know, uh, facility, even in a small way, really helps to, you know, retain women and only after you've retained them can you think of, you know, having them successfully grow or take up senior leadership roles. And um, also, you know, uh, of course, uh, there are so many policies now, especially after COVID, you know, we have seen that it works. Work from home, flexi working hours. You know, all this, of course, goes a long way. And uh, at senior levels, also, you know, the glass ceiling does exist, but as leaders, we need to go for uh, very good, you know, reviews. And going back to Shinjini's point about AI biases getting coded. So yes, to this point, I would like to add that AI is actually the new tool. And after we humans shape them, the tools shape us. So we need to be great AI parents. So the ideally, we should have sociologists and uh, psychologists alongside coders to ensure that biases, especially gender biases, are not coded. So that was yeah. a great point, you know. So these are the ways, you know, by uh, having great review systems, by trying to crack the uh, glass ceiling, by having the right mentorship, by giving equal opportunity. And, um, you know, we can definitely ensure that women not only stay, but they thrive. And uh, I think this whole gender issue being a social construct, actually, you know, there's a huge nature versus nurture debate going on. But honestly speaking, it is a social construct. And we as women need to, you know, help uh, other women get over these uh, issues that they face. Thank you for that. Before we get to everybody's closing remarks and the audience questions, I'd like to ask you, Sanjukta ji, about the regulatory framework you think is in place and how that helps and hinders women's participation? I don't think all industries have a regulatory uh, mechanism for recruitment or for retention, but the government surely does. Uh, in certain state governments and in a lot of industries, uh, like a lot of sectors in the government, you have 33% reservation for women. So that helps. Uh, in addition, once you're in the service, uh, like for example for us in the All India service, men, women, there is no bias regarding the promotion. Everybody will get promoted at a particular time. And this is something which now that there are more women, you'll have more women leaders as director generals of large forces like CRPF and, or SSB or even state police. The first one, of course, was Kanchan Chaudhary ma'am at Uttarakhand. And I think that is something that even if we try and emulate, you know, by force, there would be some women who would continue. And this is a protective discrimination which I think works. 
but when it comes to the government per se, the regulatory mechanism that we have for promotions, which is gender neutral, I think works for everyone. And that has been a very positive thing for all the women who are in the service. So even if women somewhere around mid-management, that is where you need to learn new skills. But then most of the women at that level have younger children, so you need to take care of things at home. So uh, I think the fact that you know your promotions are sort of uh, time-bound helps because then you know that you can come back to it even if you're going home to take care of your child or you're taking childcare leave which the government gives us for two years. So even then you know that you can go back, relearn your skills and get back to work again. Super, thank you so much for that insight. Lovely to wrap up, what do you think would be your top takeaways in terms of how do you think it is getting better for women or what do you think that you'd like to leave the audience with in terms of top takeaways of, of how we can increase gender participation? Well, I think that, um, you know, I, uh, when you speak about uh, leadership or we speak about mentorship, for instance, um, I think the primary and foremost thing that I try and practice, which also I've uh, sort of, I think, put together in my own being over years, is to always be open is to always have people participate in hear what people have to say. Um, it just so happens I'm, I'm on a project right now and uh, we have uh, a lot of the technical crew, we have you know all kinds of people, but there are four people that are constant to the project. And believe you me, they were not hired on, on basis of gender. They were hired on basis of what um, they brought to the table and they're all women. So the producer is a woman, the assistant director is a woman, the researcher is a woman, and I'm a woman. And like I said, I didn't hire them because they were women. Of course, it's, it's a thing that's always inside you. You always look for that. And then when you find it in young girls, you find it in a 23-year-old, you are just amazed by it. And you know that she's going to bring something special which will not be um, you know, about a set way of doing things. It'll be something new. She brings something fresh to the table. I've, as an assistant myself, I have worked with all kinds of directors, uh, mostly in the cross-cultural space. Um, so it's, you know, been a, a, a collaboration of people from across the globe. Um, and I've come across all kinds of experiences. I mean, some people are always holding their cards close to their chest, whether they are men or women. I, you know, don't want to take names, but they just don't want to reveal as directors, as the leaders of the team. They don't want to reveal what it is that they are feeling or what, what it is that they plan to do or what it is that's bothering them. They never do that. And that is something that I knew from the onset that I didn't want to do. So I think the best way of helping people uh, bring their best and the best way in making them participate is to reveal your own self and to teach without actually preaching is to be able to, you know, say to young people, I was an assistant and this is what I did. And this, I think, works and this doesn't work. And today I'm a director and I'm still struggling with what it is that works and what doesn't in a particular project. And here it is. What do you think? What do you have to say to this? And, you know, it's amazing what, what people come up with. And it's amazing how these young women have been able to uh, leave a solid mark behind every single shoot schedule that I've had. So, so I'm, you know, constantly surprised and constantly amazed by that. And I want to encourage it in any way. Like I said, I'm, I'm like we were discussing before the session, this idea of being gender agnostic in a sense, where you don't really focus on, is it a guy, is it a girl? But, um, even within that sort of broader outline, when, when you meet young girls and you know that they have dreams and they have aspirations, and, and if you can share their confidence and their underconfidence, you can actually bring about some sort of, um, yeah, difference, some sort of new way of thinking and being. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. We've got a few interesting audio, uh, audience questions and we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to First, ask Sanjukta the questions that have come for you. Why IPS and not IAS? 
Is there anything you'd like to share? And do you think that this, this frankness and openness that you possess is something that can work against you? Um, so actually my first choice was the Indian Foreign Service. So I didn't make it. I ended up being in the police. And yeah, that was, that was fun once, yeah. When I reached the police academy and I saw the outdoor schedule, I figured that I was in the right place. Um, the, the UPSC is an exam which is sort of like a lottery. You give the exam, you give your choices, depending on how you performed and how others have performed. If someone has done better than you, that person goes into the service of their choice, you go into your second or your third choice. That is the process that's been followed in the country for so many years. And so, I mean, it's by accident or by some other design that you end up in whatever service. If you're lucky, you find yourself to be in the right place. And I have been lucky. I mean, that's, that's what I think. Uh, regarding my frankness being in the police, I mean, isn't that how you're supposed to live your life? And especially for me as a police officer where I'm supposed to uphold the law and uphold equality before law. If I'm not going to be frank, then you as a citizen or you even as a victim will not get the fairness from me which I'm supposed to bring to the table. And I don't mind being frank. It has not gone against me as yet, fingers crossed. I hope nobody rats on me from here. <laughs> but it has never gone against me. I think uh, law is a matter of conscience. And if your conscience is clear, then you can deliver whatever level of the criminal justice system that you're in, you can deliver your part correctly. If I am going to be investigating a case and writing a charge sheet, when I put that charge sheet down, I will go home and sleep comfortably. And for me, my son has been, you know, my, um, my, my benchmark in a way. Like every day I think that tomorrow if I do this, if I take a decision, he will ask me, mom, why did you do that? And I should be able to frankly and honestly give him an answer and not give him something else. Thank you. Because if I lied to him, I'm making another bad human being and that is something I think I will not be able to live with. Um, yeah. There, there's a question regarding education that Kerala has so many officers and Chhattisgarh. I mean, yes, education has a role, but I think education, more than education, the number of policemen that you will have in terms of density, it depends on the government and the state government and how they want to uh, do the recruitment. Policing is a state subject, I hope you understand, under the Indian Constitution. Uh, candid opinion on women, girls joining NDA. Um, okay. Uh, women should be allowed to join whatever institution they want to. I mean, but I mean, this is like a question for the forces, so I think I will try not to answer that one. Thank you. Thank you so much. You seem to be a, a very popular panelist for us today. Uh, and, and those question slips are for you to take home and frame. Uh, to wrap up, I just want to say uh, I'm so grateful that we had this opportunity to have this conversation in front of this very august audience about what it means to be a woman leader in this day and age and how we choose to pay it forward. And whether it is just encouraging women to stick on, show up, be there, whether it is taking you know advantage of the structures that are in place, uh, to allow us to continue to do our jobs, whether it is being vulnerable or whether it is once we're reaching that space, being mentors. I think all of these things are very powerful things that we should, we should look at and we should do every day. We got a question about, you know, how do we, how do we break this patriarchy that continues? And I think just to, just to end this segment here, and I know we could have gone on for, for a while longer, I think it's about stop looking at it as patriarchy and start looking at the things that are in our control and just try to make a difference every day as you show up. So thank you so much for allowing us to show up today. Control your money. Control your money. Control your money. Uh, <laughs> sign up with don't, my salt immediately. Make sure you are at home to, to put salt in your food. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's amazing how many women just voluntarily give up control over their own money uh, and household money to men. And that, I think, is fundamentally, I mean, regardless of what I'm doing, it's, it is important. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you all for listening to us today. Thank you to my esteemed panelists.